Right. I, we're just about to be joined by a load of YouTubers, so I've just got to wait until the signal is go. Right. Um, well, I'm Paul Collier. Um, I'm a professor at the Blavatnik School, um, and it's my privilege to welcome you all um, to, this, uh, to this event. Um, I'm particularly delighted to uh, welcome our guests of honour, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Egg Imkweda, uh, who've been uh, pioneering the African uh, Initiative on Governance um, uh, as a partnership with the school. Um, and it's been going now five years. Um, and it's been a very substantial impact on the school because every year five of our MPP students are funded by AIG. Um, and uh, that's been a marvelous uh, partnership from the beginning of the school. Um, but in September, AIG pioneered a new thing, not just students, but a fellowship. The whole rationale for AIG, why it's a natural <coughs> partnership with the school, is that what you're about is building good governance and future leadership in Africa. And what we're about is trying to help do that across the world. Um, and so, yes, we need the students of the future, but we also want to celebrate good governance now. Right? Um, and that's what uh, we are doing with this fellowship. Um, uh, Professor Yeager, who I'll introduce in a moment, has been our inaugural fellow. He's been here since September. But actually today we announce um, the opening of applications for his successor, the next AIG fellow. And I think somewhere on here is the, indeed, it's actually worked, there is the website for applications. So we, uh, we very much want to encourage um, Professor Yeager, as I'll explain in a moment, has set uh, a very high standard, um, and uh, we hope and expect that it will be followed. So, um, without more ado, I'm going to invite um, Mr. Ilkwede uh, to, to come and say a few words, and then I will come back to the stage and introduce Professor Yeager. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Collier. Uh, my name is Aigwe Jaige Mokwede. I've been privileged to speak, well, not in this fantastic classroom, but in the foyer and in other spots of this great building, uh, to students and faculty of the Blavatnik School. Um, my wife and I founded the Africa Initiative for Governance um, about two years ago and simply driven by our conviction that if we have great people in public service, great things will happen in Africa. And um, I will speak to uh, Professor Jega in a minute. Yesterday, we agreed with the Nigerian government to commence a process um, of implementing a radical plan to transform the entirety of the civil service. And the reason for this is simple. In developed or advanced economies, we tend to take for granted the power of public policy. But in developing and emerging economies, the power of policy, public policy is almost all-encompassing. As I put it when I spoke yesterday, I said, look, I run businesses that employ people that make profits and pay taxes. But I live in environments where Everything that we have done can be rendered valueless by the simple stroke of a pen by a public servant. And that the truth of the matter is that when we have great public policy in Africa and I guess other parts of the developing world, transformative things happen. In Nigeria, if you're a barber and you want to express your talent in any township in Nigeria, to run a successful barbing saloon, you need a generator. 
I don't know how many successful barbers we would have in the UK if all of them had to invest in a generator to be able to, you know, I don't know, do a pog by my head. So there are people like you, and I speak to, of course, members of the uh, MPP class, who could come to Nigeria and come up with policies that address you know, challenges like why we don't have power, why we produce you know, uh, crude oil, but we import all our petroleum products and so on. And so it's for that reason that um, we embarked on, amongst other things, this partnership with uh, Oxford University's uh, Blavatnik School. And the idea is that let us start to create a critical mass of Africans who would serve their countries in the area of public policy and have a transformative <coughs> effect on their countries. One of the things that um, makes people do the right thing is to show them examples of those who have done the right thing before them and the effects of it and to celebrate them. And so we chose to institute, along with um, the, Black, the Black Ethnic School, this fellowship. And it's an annual fellowship where an individual, man or woman, who has excelled in public policy in Africa comes and takes a year to recharge their batteries, to mentor, of course, our scholars who are here and who have uh, left the school and hopefully are doing good things in, in, in Africa. And of course, I mean, to, in a sense, prepare for their reentry to continue to do good things. The gentleman that is going to speak to you this evening, you may take for granted, but I don't. Because frankly speaking, before he was appointed to head the Independent National Electoral Commission called the INEC, I did not believe that Nigeria could conduct free and fair elections, simple. Now, um, I'm a leader of the private sector. I've been old enough to vote for a while. And therefore, I think my opinion as to whether or not you could conduct free and fair elections in my country should count for something. You might think it's simple, but the fact is that up till and until his leadership, we couldn't. And because we couldn't, we gave every excuse for every political party and every political aspirant not to believe in the electoral process and therefore to approach politics from an essentially corrupted value system. And you can imagine what the results would be. And against that background, the idea that a first term president in an African country as large as Nigeria would lose an election was just, I mean, it, 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 you didn't think it could happen. And so you can imagine, therefore, that in Africa, you win your first term and you're almost guaranteed to win your second term. And you can imagine the effects on what governance, um, what takes place in governance. But then, of course, um, we had the good fortune of a gifted leader appointed into the INEC. And he did many things, and it wasn't easy, and I guess he will speak to them. And up to the last minutes, up to the very last minutes of this process, um, all the challenges you can imagine read their head. But it's based fundamentally on the things he did and the leadership he provided that history was made. And indeed, I think the greatest, um, the greatest plaudit actually given to the outgoing president was appointing him, the man who oversaw the election that took him out. Now, since then, we have had other elections in Africa. And the typical pattern for many elections in Africa is that when things go wrong, because there is no example to point to, we let them be. In Gambia, you've heard a story. In Ghana, you've heard a story. But what you may not know is that behind that story is the Nigeria story. The Nigeria story that was architected by Professor Atari Jega, Jega, who will be speaking today. And with what he did, almost clearly a line has been drawn in the sand as far as electoral processes in Nigeria and in Africa are concerned. That just like it works in the UK and it works in the USA, don't mind what Trump says. 
that your vote will count. And those public servants who are responsible for ensuring that free and fair electoral processes take place will deliver successfully. And so we celebrate Professor Jiga, who made history in Nigeria, who made history in Africa, and who has made me a believer in the electoral process. I'm very proud as a Nigerian to be associated with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, no words are needed from me after that. But um, since I'm scheduled to speak and there are my bosses here, I better say something. Um, the, um, uh, and, and what I want to say is that, um, and, and those students who will be attending my course next term on economic development, um, the central message of it is that whether a country succeeds or not, depends primarily upon the outcome of internal struggles. All successful countries are built on domestic struggles. Um, foreigners, outsiders can't develop you. Always struggles are primarily internal. And, um, and struggles are only one with one essential ingredient and that is courage. Um, and uh, so every successful country has been built on the courage of the few. Now, one major struggle, and a country is built on several struggles, but one major struggle is for the proper conduct of elections. Now, I'm a an economist and I do quantitative analysis and so one of my papers last year um, was published um, investigated does it actually matter for an economy for de economic development whether uh, elections are properly conducted and that's a researchable question which I've researched right? there's a Huge world data set now. There's over 700 elections around the world. And there are lots of processes of scrutiny which can classify elections into basically free and fair or contaminated. And about 30% of those 700 elections around the world are in some way contaminated. 70% are basically free and fair. So what I and my colleague looked at was to see, does it matter for, for, for economic performance. Um, and in particular, what we looked at was to see if a government has either messed up the economy or run the economy particularly well, does that influence its chances of being re-elected? Right? Obviously, to have any incentive effect, um, it's rather important <coughs> that the... The, the governments which mess up an economy have a lower chance of, of re-election than the governments which deliver good economic performance. Right? And so that's what we investigate. And there's a clear result. In the 70% of countries that have free and fair elections, there it is. If you want to stay in power, you better try and run the economy well. Right? <coughs> and in the 30% of elections which are contaminated, that effect disappears. With contaminated elections, the government gets away with it. And that's why the struggle for honest elections is so important for economic development. Now, um, I was one of the people who um, helped to get Professor Yeager to come here. Um, and I'm very proud of that because Professor Yeager was one of those people who was called upon to show courage and did so. Okay. And as Mr. Nequeda has just said, courage gets imitated. And already in West Africa, there are two other societies 
that owe a debt to Professor Yeager for their successful transitions. And so, without further ado, let me give you Professor Yeager. Professor Collier, the chairman of this occasion, distinguished uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Um, let me begin by thanking Professor Collier for his very kind words and also our guest of honor, uh, Mr. Aig Imokade, uh, for also his very kind words. I would like to express my appreciation to the Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government, uh, Professor Nairi Woods, and all the good people of BSG uh, who have made my six months stay here exciting and uh, intellectually uh, stimulating. I've had a very wonderful experience. I wish I could stay forever, but uh, I can't. <laughs> and um, um, I also would want to thank all of you who are here today uh, to uh, uh, listen to my presentation, and in particular, I want to thank Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Aig Emokede for coming all the way from all their busy schedules to be a part uh, of this event. My presentation uh, is on electoral integrity in Africa, and uh, primarily drawing the lessons from Nigeria's 2011 and 2015 general elections. And I have an outline. Uh, I would try first of all to uh, give a general introduction, uh, hopefully to be able to tie in the issue of uh, democracy, democratization in Africa, elections, and also the uh, main issue of electoral integrity. Uh, after which then I hope to uh, discuss the Nigerian context for those of you who may be here and who would need to understand the context within which we operated for five years in order to try to bring integrity to the conduct uh, of elections. Uh, then I will focus on what I consider to be the five key challenges which in the five years that we were in the Electoral Commission we tried to address and the extent to which we are able to address them uh, 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 helped in terms of the level of integrity that was brought to bear on the electoral process. Uh, after identifying the challenges, I would uh, 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 look at, if there is time, as many of the ways and the manners in which we addressed each uh, of these challenges. Uh, of course, after all is said and done, there are quite a number of outstanding challenges, and I have concluded uh, uh, that uh, sustainability is important, and sustainability will require uh, uh, resilience in addressing the outstanding uh, challenges. So by way of introduction, uh, I begin by observing that elections can either be positive or negative, in terms of their impact on democratization. And I think this is a settled issue uh, amongst uh, uh, scholars and researchers uh, on this topic. Whether or not the impact is positive is to a large extent related to whether or not elections are conducted with integrity. Uh, the UN Global Commission on Elections, Democracy, and Security issued a report in 2012, and it made the following point, and I quote, elections can further democracy, development, human security, uh, human rights and security, or undermine them. And for this reason alone, they should command attention, end of quote. It also added that for elections to embody democracy, further development and promote security, they must be conducted with integrity. At the level of scholarship, uh, 
Pippa Norris is a professor at Harvard and uh, uh, for a number of years now has been directing the Electoral Integrity Project at the Kennedy School of Government, also observed as follows, and I quote, well-run elections by themselves are insufficient for successful transitions to democracy, but flawed or even failed contests are thought to wreck fragile regimes. I started with these quotations because I think that they underscore the significance of uh, elections, why attention needs to be paid to them, and why they should be conducted with integrity. Since the decade of the 1990s, the uh, 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 hailed decade of the wave of democratization globally, formal democracy can be said to have been established in virtually all African countries, although its substantive features are yet to be firmly rooted. As part of the formal trappings of democracy, of course, elections are periodically conducted with aspirations of them being free and fair and yielding true choices of the people as representatives in the legislature or as heads of the executive arms of government. However, in most cases, the conduct of elections uh, lack integrity, uh, are flawed, and replete with irregularities, and they generated or continue to generate very negative consequences on stability, on democratization itself, and on governance. So I agree that there is no African exceptionalism when we talk about lack of electoral integrity or flawed uh, elections. But I think the scale of irregularities is immense, and arguably more than in any other part uh, of the world. So although democratization has gained a foothold in Africa, and there is regular holding of elections in most countries, poorly conducted elections are the norm, and they have imposed remarkable constraints on stability, on regime legitimacy, and on good democratic governance. Here I emphasize good democratic governance. I think there is a difference from uh, just good governance and uh, good governance being contextualized uh, with democratic uh, uh, tenets. I want to emphasize this point by showing you a couple of tables. One is the classification of African regimes, and I've taken this from the uh, democracy indexed by the Economic Intelligence Unit. Uh, globally, first of all, they uh, classified regimes in terms of full democracies, flawed democracies, hybrid democracies, and authoritarian regimes. Uh, all over the world, they said there are 19 countries that can be considered as full democracies. Only one is from Africa. Flawed democracies, there are 57 worldwide and seven uh, in Africa. Hybrid democracies, there are 40 worldwide, 14 uh, in Africa, and I guess where Nigeria is, is considered now uh, as part of the hybrid uh, classification. And then authoritarian regimes, 51 worldwide, and almost half of those uh, in the African uh, continent. Um, I mentioned uh, Professor Pippa Norris and the commendable work they are doing on uh, studying electoral integrity in Harvard. They have developed an index, what they call the Electoral Integrity Index, uh, uh, perceptions of electoral integrity, uh, and uh, I have taken the component of the African countries uh, uh, here. Four, uh, six countries are classified in Africa as high to very high, with an index of 60% uh, or plus. Uh, 12 are considered as moderate, uh, ranging 
from 50 to 59, and uh, 23 are considered as low or very low. And um, the key point I want to emphasize here is that clearly democracy has long been said to be uh, the only game in town. And um, obviously, in terms of democracy and economic development, the linkages have been established. And uh, for Africa to progress, I think we need to meet commendable progress, not just in terms of the formal rituals of conducting elections, uh, but also deeply entrenching democracy and ensuring that its substantive features uh, take firm root. And uh, obviously, uh, elections with integrity uh, contribute remarkably in that direction. Now, in, in, in general, uh, scholars and the researchers raise pertinent questions with regards to the issue of electoral integrity. In the African context, at least three questions are raised. What dynamics shape or impact upon the integrity of African elections? Secondly, what challenges are faced in conducting elections with integrity and how are these addressed? And uh, 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 obviously, uh, uh, it is important that we do or contribute in terms of trying to understand uh, these uh, uh, issues. And uh, uh, basically, uh, what I try to do uh, uh, is to see if my contributions arising from the experience that I have had in the five years as chairman of the Electoral Commission in Nigeria uh, can help us in terms of uh, uh, addressing uh, some of these uh, questions. For policy practitioners, the fundamental question, of course, is um, policy practitioners who are interested in development, who are interested in questions of stability and also questions of good governance, I think the fundamental question is how to conduct elections with integrity and with positive impact on both stability, democratization, and governance. Now, this is where uh, my little experience has come in. Uh, until 2010, I had been in the Nigerian university system for about 30 years and uh, uh, was so comfortable in the ivory tower that I could go out for brief fellowships and go back, but never ventured uh, into public service. But I was dragged out and uh, asked to now try to address this fundamental uh, uh, policy uh, question of conducting elections with integrity and also ensuring that it has impact both on stability, on democratization, and on governance. So I had the opportunity between June 2010 and July 2015 to gather with 12 national commissioners uh, uh, to address this question. And what I try to do is to summarize the experience that we had and how we address the challenges that we uh, uh, confronted uh, in order to bring integrity to the election in our country. Let me quickly talk about the context. Nigeria, of course, the so-called giant of Africa, uh, is large, is populous, and is diverse. The current estimation is that population projection is put at about 185 million. Uh, and we have about 500 plus ethno-linguistic groups in our country. Of course, there are three major uh, ethnic groups, uh, and uh, uh, there are many Nigerians in this room, and uh, so I don't know whether they agree with me, but I think one important uh, issue to highlight is that Nigeria is probably one of the few countries in the world where whatever could go wrong with governance has gone wrong. <laughs> um, we had military rule for 27 years out of the 57 years that Nigeria has been uh, independent uh, from colonial rule. 
We had a civil war, very devastating civil war, uh, with all sorts of things, uh, ethnic cleansing and uh, ethno-regional uh, conflicts and so on, and devastation. And we moved from oil boom in the 1970s to what now is generally considered as an oil curse, uh, the squandering of the riches arising from that, the accession of uh, uh, public treasuries through uh, public office, uh, and of course the undermining of the economic development capacity of the country. And then of course we have experienced and continue to experience, experience numerous ethno religious and communal conflicts. Uh, there is restiveness uh, uh, and the militancy in the Niger Delta. And there is now insurgency in the northeastern part of the country with the Boko Haram uh, phenomenon. And of course, there has been phenomenal corruption and bad governance, and what in Nigeria we call acute poverty amidst plenty. These are very, very serious challenges. Uh, sometimes I, I doubt if uh, any country but Nigeria can really muddle through these uh, challenges. Uh, but in spite of all this, Nigeria has shown remarkable resilience and elasticity in weathering uh, the storm. However, due to the nature of Nigeria's ethnic and religious diversity, Nigeria has a highly polarized political environment characterized by ethno-religious mobilization and a history of poorly conducted elections with associated violence uh, because of this ethno-religious mobilization. There is no time to go into this, but a lot of these ethno-religious tensions are associated, of course, with the earlier colonial history and the divide and rule tactics as the colonial powers pitched one group against the other. And of course, the post-colonial elite uh, found those divide and rule tactics uh, helpful in their own strategies of getting into power. And the military rule, in particular, institutionalized that process of mobilizing ethnicity and religion uh, uh, in order to legitimize their stay in power. So. With return to civil rule in 1999, after about 27 years of military rule, elections became the legitimate means of acquiring political power. But politicians deployed all means necessary to acquire legitimate power, and the electoral contests were perceived as do or die affairs. Very violent and uh, uh, replete with irregularities. Elections became mere rituals and progressively lacking in integrity. The 1999 elections, which heralded the return to civil rule, uh, were barely accepted uh, because everybody wanted the military out, you know, and wanted uh, civil democratic rule. But 2003 elections, four years later, were considered as worse than 1999 elections, and the 2007 elections were considered as the worst elections in the history of uh, Nigeria. Uh, Chairman Professor Collier, I think, has a lot of stories to tell in his 2009 book, Wars, Guns, and Votes, uh, on, on the 2007 uh, elections. But what is clear is that both domestic and international observers recognized it as the worst election. And uh, of course, uh, while some citizens resorted to disengagement from the electoral arena because of gross dissatisfaction uh, with the process, and uh, were becoming increasingly indifferent to uh, the political and the electoral processes in the country, I think the significant thing is that some organized civil society groups formed alliances and coalitions and became more actively engaged in advocacy for electoral and wider political reforms. Uh, I had uh, the privilege to participate in uh, the MPP policy uh, making uh, uh, 
is it deep discussion? Uh, and uh, I, I gave an illustration deeper. Uh, I, gave, I gave this example of, as an example of collective action, which actually worked and which had tremendous impact on, on uh, uh, the uh, Nigerian political and electoral processes. Now, as I said, I was appointed in June 2010. And I must say that I took it for granted that the job wasn't going to be difficult. Uh, I felt that I had known enough about Nigerian politics uh, as somebody who has studied it and somebody who has also been active as the chairman or president of the Nigerian Academic Staff Union under military rule and uh, who struggled against military rule. Uh, and. Um, and also somebody who had been a vice chancellor for almost five years. I, I, I thought I had seen all challenges and could handle anything that came uh, my way. Um, some of my friends uh, tried to discourage me from taking the job. Uh, they said nobody went to INEC as chairman and came out with his or her integrity, his integrity, because virtually all were men. Uh, and that they thought I had some integrity and that I should uh, zealously guard it and not go and mess it up in the elections. And uh, I reflected over this and against all the advice, I said, what is integrity if it can't be tested? You know, so I took the job, but having taken the job, I also uh, was uh, quite condescending, thinking that really, I knew how I could uh, handle it. But as it turned out, it is easier said than done. And uh, as with many things in Nigeria, the more you see, the less you understand. And as I, as I saw the things in INEC and began to understand them, it was clear to me that I had taken something that I had never uh, imagined that I could take. And I soon learned a personal lesson which is that never take anything for granted, never underrate anything, and never underestimate the challenges you come across. But the more general good lesson, I think, uh, after all is said and done, is that although relatively difficult, it turned out that conducting elections with integrity is not impossible, but it requires planning, it requires extensive and effective organization, it requires focus, it requires resilience, it requires protecting and defending the relative autonomy of the election management body, and it also requires integrity. And of course, all of these are also easier said than done. So basically, our experience in the, in, in the Nigerian uh, electoral process between 2010 and 2015 actually illustrate all these things I have just mentioned. And uh, I think there are good lessons also for other countries in Africa with similar circumstances and experiences. And I hope to tease this out as I look at the challenges. Um, I have mentioned that there are five major challenges. There are many challenges. But I think I can focus on five key challenges uh, which have a bearing on the integrity of the electoral process. I think the first challenge we faced was how to strengthen the election management body, how to cleanse it of the image that it had acquired over time, and how to make it efficient and effective in the delivery of elections with integrity. Um, after the 2007 elections, clearly INEC was written off by many Nigerians as a cash and carry organization. That's what Nigerians called it. That you can, uh, uh, that the electoral commission actually sells results to the highest bidder. And that kind of image was very, very difficult to address and uh, 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 was, in, was, was obstructive of trying to to do an effective election with in integrity. So we had to pay attention on that. The second major challenge we faced was how to deal with persistent, prevalent aspects of electoral fraud, uh, which permeated the electoral process. 
and there are many of them. Uh, I think all ranges of electoral fraud that you can think of, we can find them in Nigeria and uh, in, multiple, uh, in multiples of extent and magnitude. From ballot paper and the result sheets snatching, to ballot paper staffing, to multiple voting, to result alteration, to false declaration of results by electoral uh, returning officers, to hijacking of electoral materials, to assaulting electoral officials and forcing them to do what uh, the politicians wanted, to vote buying and the uh, purchase of results from coalition and returning uh, officers. And uh, this was so deeply entrenched and it's a huge challenge trying to address them. The third challenge was on how to secure the integrity of the electoral role or the register of voters. Because clearly in all electoral jurisdictions, the integrity of the voters register uh, is to a large extent uh, uh, linked to the integrity of the election uh, itself. And of course the Nigerian voters register uh, required uh, 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 a lot of effort to make it uh, have integrity. So we had to do quite a lot in that regard. Uh, the fourth challenge we faced was on how to make election day logistics and procedures transparent, accountable, and efficient. Uh, we had situations in which things were getting progressively worse and the elections are supposed to start, say, at uh, 8 o'clock. And in some polling units, it may not start until 12. And of course, the excuses were that Nigeria is a large country with difficult terrain, with poor infrastructure, you know, and it can always be explained away. But if we needed elections with integrity, we also needed to pay attention to ensuring that when you say polling units will open at so-so-so time, they actually open uh, at that time. So we had to address this challenge, and it was a formidable challenge also to address. The fifth uh, area of challenge, the, the five major challenges I have mentioned, relate to how to create a level playing field for all parties and all contestants. It's taken for granted that an incumbent government will win, win elections and they will get attract favors from not the elect, electoral body but from all the other government agencies that the electoral body would have to partner with. And uh, weaker parties are always at disadvantage and uh, contestants that are not incumbents also had very serious challenges in that regard. So how do you create a level playing field for all parties, big or small, and all contestants in the electoral process? Uh, of course, there are other challenges. Uh, I think there is a sixth one uh, relating to how to protect and strengthen the relative autonomy of the election management body uh, particularly in terms of its relationship with political parties, its relationship with the legislature, and its relationship with the incumbent executive arm of government. So we try to tackle these uh, uh, challenges, and I will try and take them one by one, and uh, as much as time permits, uh, uh, give you illustrations of what uh, uh, we did. With regards to the issue of how to strengthen the election management body and cleanse it of its negative image, uh, we realized that INEC, as we found it, needed to be restructured and reorganized. And uh, in fact, that process of restructuring and reorganization would require uh, laying off many of the staff and bringing fresh, uh, competent uh, people uh, into the commission. But we came in six months to a scheduled uh, election. Uh, in fact, because of the challenge of the voters register, we had to engage the legislature and the executive to have a constitutional amendment to give us three additional months so that we could do a fresh register before the elections. So clearly restructuring and reorganization was not going to be feasible within that time frame. So what we did was to say, okay, before the 2011 election, let us do minimal readjustments and reorganization and bring some 
first of all, we did what we call the positioning by placing what we call square pegs in square holes, you know, and moving people away whom we thought were not, would not be right for the positions that they were occupying. And, of course, we also tried to uh, uh, use some carrot and stick tactics. We identified people uh, who clearly have a lot against them in terms of having been involved in corrupt practices or misconduct in the conduct of previous elections, and we immediately disengaged them. And then we told the staff that uh, we would not ask them to do anything wrong, and we would not expect anybody to do anything wrong, and whoever did that would have himself or herself uh, to blame. And of course, uh, with some motivation and this uh, carrot and stick uh, disciplinary uh, approach, we were also able to carry as many people along with the idea of uh, contributing more positively to the conduct of elections with credibility. But we also had to use a model which I think was, uh, has its own challenges, but was the only option we had under the circumstances. We felt that INEC, the Electoral Commission, being a very weak uh, uh, institution uh, that needed to be reformed, that lacked capacity from within for this reform, we had to bring people from outside to help drive the reform process in the commission. And I was able to get about a team of about five uh, people in the office of the chairman who busied themselves in terms of the planning of the reorganization and reform process while the other staff were uh, focused in terms of uh, uh, the actual day-to-day -day, uh, conduct of the election. Uh, it was a model, as I said, which is very challenging because uh, quite early the perception that outsiders have been brought in uh, to reform the organization was met with resistance. And uh, obviously, uh, 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 many people in the organization tried to do what in Nigeria we call say, don't look. Okay, let's, let's see if they want to change, let them change it. And, um, uh, but we remained resilient. And uh, of course, with time, uh, uh, many people turned around and recognized that that was the only option in terms of repositioning and restructuring uh, the, the organization. Um, so through this combination of uh, uh, minimal restructuring and reorganization, we were able to go through the first electoral elections of 2011. But immediately after the 2011 elections, because the next elections were in 2015, we now took our time to do serious restructuring and reorganization of the commission. We engaged a competent uh, 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 management firm to advise us, and we took some of the advice, and we did internal reviews of the conduct of the 2011 elections and a thorough evaluation of the structure and the organization, and we came up with a structured INEC removing duplications of responsibilities, removing, eliminating actually departments that were unnecessary, and uh, having a trim structure with a focus on effective and efficient delivery of electoral services. And the time we had uh, between 2011 and 2015 was, import was significant because we partnered with many development, uh, uh, Nigeria's development partners, uh, to support that process of uh, reform and reorganization with extensive training uh, for the repositioned uh, staff uh, and uh, uh, capacity building uh, uh, efforts. Um, I move to the next challenge, which is the challenge of how to deal with persistent and prevalent aspects of electoral fraud. And we try to address this uh, in two ways. First, we said there is need to return to the basics. And there are basic things that every election management body needed to do. You needed to secure electoral materials. Electoral materials were not being secured. So we tried everything possible to secure election materials. Uh, secure them from hijacking and secure them from uh, fraudulent uh, conduct by politicians or even by the staff of the Electoral Commission. 
For example, we had to introduce measures with regards to uh, 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 serial numbering and the color coding of ballot papers and result sheets uh, in order to deal with the problem of politicians diverting uh, ballot papers from one state to another and are still being able to use them uh, in the electoral process. Um, then, of course, we brought the use of technology uh, 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 to addressing many of these uh, persistent uh, challenges. Um, as I discussed, the next issue, which is the biometric registration, uh, to deal with the challenge of uh, how to secure the integrity of the uh, uh, role or the register of voters, you can see how we've brought a lot of uh, uh, use of technology in that regard. Um, we discovered that the electoral register with which the 20, 2007 elections were conducted lacked integrity. Um, in, in all the fundamental respects of the questions you raise relating to the compilation of a register. Are there missing names of citizens? Many people who have registered were not captured in the register. Are there ineligible people on the register? Many people who are ineligible, either small kids who are under 18, you know, or names of trees were all on the register. Um, there were even people like uh, Queen Elizabeth, <laughs> Mike Tyson, and the others were all registered, uh, uh, were all people named uh, on, on the register. And it was clear to us if we had to do elections with integrity, there was no way we could conduct the 2011 elections with the register that we saw. And uh, we had six months, as I said, when we came in. So, that's when it became clear to us that if we did the elections in January of 2011, as the Constitution required, we would merely be going through the rituals, knowing fully well a priori from the beginning that it was not going to have integrity, because the voters register lacked integrity. So we engaged the government, we engaged the legislature, we engaged civil society organizations that have been doing advocacy for electoral reforms, and we got the support of that. The constitution was amended. We got three months extension. And then we had to do substantial procurement and uh, to be able to do registration. Uh, many of our development partners felt that it was not going to be possible to do what we were trying to embark upon. Uh, but we were able to pull it through. Um, we had to use a very expensive methodology, of course, in order to be able to do this. Uh, we had to deploy a registration equipment in each of the close to 120,000 polling stations so that anybody who was registrable within a period of time and came out could be registered. So that meant a huge public expenditure to procure the registration uh, uh, equipment. Uh, of course, we tried to reduce the cost by ensuring that we developed the software in-house without having to, uh, to rely on vendors, uh, because part of the problem was the register leading to the 20, uh, 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 2007 elections was because of the reliance on vendors to do it, and multiple vendors were used, and the data could not even be integrated at the back end because of different softwares, and, uh, and then the issues of licensing and proprietary rights also came in. So we took all this into consideration, uh, did our own in-house registration software, uh, had a plan for our own back end uh, developed with our own um, in-house uh, uh, software uh, people, and we were able to do the registration uh, within a period of three weeks. We were able to register 73.5 million uh, voters, uh, and uh, uh, of course we had to issue them what we call temporary called laminates cards, and only later, after the 2011 elections, then we gave them the uh, permanent uh, voters uh, cards. Um, of course, after the registration, we had to, to integrate the data and to clean it up using the advanced fingerprint identification software. Again, we have to minimize costs. We had to use uh, open source 
uh, softwares that are available to be able to clean the register. Uh, we found a robust one which we put to good use and uh, minimized some of the costs associated with that. And we were able to have a good database, both one national database of the electoral roll as well as one in each of the 36 states of the Federation and the Federal uh, Capital uh, Territory. And of course, uh, we were able to have a register with which we did the 2011 elections and which we then further cleaned uh, 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 to a level that we felt very comfortable before we did the 2015 general elections. But in order to further improve uh, the uh, utilization uh, uh, of the register with integrity and to minimize the prevalent abuses, we also decided to use technology uh, uh, in that regard. So the permanent voters cards which we issued were actually smart cards that had uh, embedded uh, contactless chips that carried all the biometric details that have been captured of the registered voters you know, and uh, uh, which, from the specifications we developed, could last up to 10 years. Uh, regrettably, in Nigeria, because we don't have a national registration ID card system, uh, the Electoral Commission constitutionally is mandated to issue uh, what is called permanent voters' cards uh, for, for elections. So we issued a card that we thought uh, could last at least 10 years, which means cover at least two electoral and cycles without having to, to do another additional expenditure. But having done that smart card, voters' cards, we felt that we can also increase the integrity of the electoral process by using a smart card reader so that basically we can uh, um, verify people when they bring the cards to the polling units and we can, using biometrics, also authenticate the voters that appeared. And by doing that, we were able to eliminate a very prevalent practice in the Nigerian context where politicians move voters from one polling unit to the other in the course of an election day you know, and could mo vote multiple times. And uh, we were also able to ensure that dead people no longer uh, voted <laughs> uh, in the Nigerian uh, uh, context. Uh, I have a few of these to show you. This is how the permanent voters' cards look like. This is my own. Uh, these are the card readers that we used. The card readers are verified by swiping it under the uh, device. Uh, and then the authentication is the putting of the fingerprint on, on the device uh, to authenticate uh, the voter. So... Um, Use of technology, we found, was very, very useful uh, and can tremendously add to the integrity uh, of elections. And uh, 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 in Nigeria, we have come some way uh, in terms of using adaptable technology uh, uh, in, in that uh, regard. Um, of course, uh, the other thing we addressed uh, is how to make election day logistics and procedures transparent and uh, uh, accountable. And uh, we've done uh, at least uh, uh, two things in that regard. First of all, we did a georeferencing using GIS of all the polling units and uh, did extensive mapping of all the polling units. Uh, we also uh, were able to uh, have additional vehicles, but then we entered into partnerships also with the Road uh, Transport Workers Union, which helped us a lot in terms of movement of materials uh, and uh, uh, logistics. Uh, and then we also had to partner with the armed forces, both the military, the uh, uh, Air Force and the Navy, uh, not only for the movement of election materials and personnel, but also for the protection uh, of, of these, particularly in areas that have serious security challenges in the Niger Delta, as well as in the uh, northeastern part uh, uh, of the country where we have the Boko Haram uh, insurgency. And uh, by the time we did the 2015 general elections, we had improved the logistics tremendously 
And in fact, uh, the, uh, some civil society organizations in partnership with the National Democratic Institute uh, did uh, parallel tabulation and uh, collected a lot of information uh, on election day processes. And uh, they issued a report in 2015 that by 8 o'clock, around 87% of the polling units had opened. And in the Nigerian context, that was really phenomenal. Because if you compare it with 2007, not up to 50% of the polling units had opened by 8 o'clock. Uh, and by the time we did the 2011 elections, given the limited time that we had, uh, just barely 74% of the polling units uh, opened. So there is a lot to be done in that regard, but we were able to upscale and improve the logistics and the preparations of the elections. And of course, it also helped a lot in terms of uh, the integrity of the election, uh, reducing the downtime, uh, ensuring people uh, uh, are able to vote uh, in time. Um, let me uh, quickly move on to uh, the issue of creation of a level playing field for all parties and contestants. I think the major challenge associated with this is the general perception that the Electoral Commission is closed, uh, that uh, it, 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 it wasn't receptive uh, uh, to inquiries and to sharing of information, and also that it was too cozy, uh, as many uh, uh, politicians say, opposition politicians say, it was too cozy with the incumbent uh, government. So the key challenge is how to address that perception and also how to, in reality, uh, create structures and mechanisms that would make the work of the commission very transparent, very open, and also very inclusive. And we try to do this uh, by improving or re re revising the business processes of the commission, uh, making them more open and transparent and more efficient, and also by uh, uh, developing regular consultations with all ranges of stakeholders. For the first time, we introduced regular quarterly meetings with the chairman and secretaries of all political parties to hear their complaints or receive their uh, suggestions and input, uh, or for us to actually uh, make submissions to them before we finalize in some of the policies. And as we moved close to the election, we also reduced the time of these meetings and increased the regularity from quarterly to one month, every month preceding the election in the last year before the election. And that helped tremendously by improving uh, mutual confidence and trust, by sharing information, by being inclusive and taking suggestions, and also by ensuring that all contestants and parties felt comfortable with not only the extent of preparation, but with the mindset of the commission in terms of trying to do a fair, uh, 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 provide a fair playing field uh, for all contestants. We did this not only with political parties, even civil society organizations, we organize regular meetings. We also do the same thing with the media. Um, although most media houses uh, send representation in the commission, but we also created platforms for periodic meetings with editors, even with newspaper proprietors. And it went a long way, particularly when we wanted them to also be a part of the voter education uh, 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 process, uh, sensitization, public enlightenment, and voter uh, uh, education. We did this with security agencies. We created what we called an interagency consultative committee on election security. Uh, many people say, why should the military or the other, why should any security agency other than the police have a role in the conduct of election? And of course, for us, it was clear that the systemic security challenges in Nigeria required an effective partnership with the security agencies in order to be able to deliver uh, credible elections. So we created this interagency consultative committee and met periodically. And uh, through it, we were able to minimize inter-service rivalry, 
to define the key role of each security agency with regards to election and to be able to get them to work together and where there are financial requirements to be able to have a common budget which could be used to fund their participation in the electoral process. And uh, we found that very useful because not only did it operate at the national level, but it also went down at the state level where the resident electoral commissioner in charge of the state would meet with the police commissioner, the army commander, and all the other uh, tiers of, of the security agencies. This we found very useful, and it helped us to deal with security challenges, particularly in the 2015 uh, uh, general elections. And we were able to drastically minimize not only the violent conduct associated with participation in the election, but even the statistics of the figures of um, uh, death associated with elections uh, came down uh, quite uh, uh, remarkably. Um, the key challenge, of course, was dealing with the government. And I have a lot of stories to tell in the book that I hope to finish <laughs> uh, in that regard. You know, but, but the key challenge really is uh, uh, to, to not be too cozy, as the perception was with the incumbent government, and also not to even be seen to be cozy with the incumbent government. And it required a lot of effort to be able to make the government, the incumbent government, realize that the Constitution says that you are an independent election management body. You are not a bureaucracy uh, under the executive uh, branch, even though for funding you have to go uh, through them. And there is that conflation of responsibility and undermining of the autonomy of the election management body, and we had to do quite a lot uh, uh, to deal uh, with that. The same thing with the legislature. And in particular also, because in Nigeria, procurement is a key area of corruption. And uh, if you are in the election management body or what is called a lucrative public sector agency, you also have to deal with a lot of challenges from uh, public uh, 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 officials, whether in the legislature or in the executive, that try to influence the procurement process. And it's a very, very challenging issue to be able to block it uh, or to find ways of ensuring that it really does not derail the integrity of the procurement process and also the electoral uh, process uh, uh, itself. And uh, in terms of, and again, related to this, of course, it's, it's uh, the uh, uh, continuous effort to assert the constitutional uh, independence that is provided to the election uh, management uh, body. Uh, for example, it was a serious battle uh, for the Electoral Commission to protect a provision in the Constitution that granted it financial autonomy. Uh, for many electoral jurisdictions in Africa, I suppose in many third world countries, lack of financial autonomy undermines the integrity of the election because you have to go cap in hand to the executive to plead for resources. And if they don't want an election, they can deny you funds and you can't conduct elections without funds. In the Nigerian context, when the uh, constitution was amended uh, after the 2007 elections, because of this pressure of civil society organizations for reforms, the independence, financial independence of INEC was protected. Uh, so INEC was allowed to have what they call a statutory transfer fund in the central bank. And once its budget is approved by and appropriated by the legislature, then the funding is regularly disbursed to that statutory transfer fund, independent of the ministry. Of course, the Minister of Finance will channel it, you know, but independence of the budget office in terms of control uh, and, and the disbursement. And that helped the integrity uh, of the commission in terms of being able to plan its work. And we kept this money in the central bank. If we had to invest it, we invested it in treasury bonds. And that was one area where we also came under tremendous pressure because politicians, knowing that there is a lot of money out there, were interested in directing where this money is 
uh, should be uh, um, kept, you know. And uh, obviously, we had to resist that. And uh, the, the easiest way is to say, look, this money remains in the central bank. And if we have to invest it, there is the low risk investment of putting it in treasury bills, which is more secure than any other form uh, of uh, investment. Um, so I think we've taken quite a lot of time. Uh, there is the extended version of the paper, and I'm sure it will be uh, circulated. Uh, but I want to say that uh, in the five years that we were in INEC, we were able to do an election. In 2011, we raised the bar. Everybody said the election was much, much better than 2007. And in 2015, we further raised the bar. And uh, virtually all uh, domestic and international observers and key stakeholders uh, appreciated the value addition in terms of the integrity uh, of the electoral uh, uh, process. Uh, and I think it helped to revive confidence uh, and uh, improve the perception that if we participate, our votes now can count. Because after 2007, the perception is that our votes don't count. So why even uh, participate? And I think that has been good. And the general uh, 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 appreciation that came from the international community also helped a lot to, to boost uh, uh, that aspect of recognizing the need to do elections with integrity and the need for people to participate and the need to ensure that participation impacts on the selection of uh, uh, legislators and uh, the executive branch. So what are the lessons? Of course, as I said, there are outstanding challenges. Let me quickly mention them. I think one big area I consider an, a, a challenge that is outstanding is with regards to voter education. Participation in a country like Nigeria would require extensive voter education, public enlightenment, and sensitization. Because most of the people live in the rural areas, and of course, there is a high illiteracy rate. Uh, and uh, um, uh, so the, a lot of effort is required, and it's very expensive if you have to, to use multiple media. Uh, and um, our participation, uh, in, 20, in 2011, we have 58% uh, of the registered voters uh, participating. But in uh, 2015, it came down to about 54%. You know, so there is really a need to do a lot of that. But lessons. Quickly, I, I understand I've taken so much time. Um, I apologize for that. But the first lesson, I believe, is that we have to recognize that it may be difficult, but it is not impossible to conduct elections with integrity. And I think uh, we've learned that bitter lesson. And I think it's important that uh, uh, in other electoral jurisdictions in Africa, the electoral commissions come with a mindset that this is doable. And uh, the primary preoccupation will be planning of how to do it, rather than being overwhelmed with the challenges and feeling that it may be impossible to do that. I say this because last week I was in Kenya and I participated in the UNDP organized induction course for the new election electoral commission. They have an election coming in August. They are coming just like our own situation in 2010, coming six months uh, before an election. And by looking at their faces and their comments and their body language, you can see that they already feel that uh, this thing may not be uh, possible. And, uh, uh, the key challenge is really it's possible, it's difficult, but it's possible, and you really have to work hard to get it done. Uh, of course, don't underestimate the challenges and don't underrate them. Um, but what is most significant is a review, a study of the past experiences, and we must learn from the past, and we must endeavor not to make mistakes that have been made uh, before. So that learning process was very significant for us in INEC. We had to do a lot of learning before the election. What were the challenges of the past? How do we overcome them? How do we make sure we don't repeat even mistakes that we also made uh, in 2011? How do we make sure we don't make it? So that is very important. And then learning from others and sharing knowledge and experiences, we found it very, very 
uh, useful. Uh, being focused and resilient is very important. Planning is necessary. And lastly, stakeholder engagement and sensitization is also very, very important. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of the other things that remain, uh, I'm sure if you have the paper, you can see it. So I think that we need to pay a lot of attention to elections in Africa. We need to pay a lot of attention to studying these elections, to understanding the dynamics of how they are conducted, and to focusing attention in terms of how can we continuously improve the integrity of the conduct of elections uh, in Africa. And I hope the study I'm trying to do, although a case study of Nigeria, where what I've spent a lot of time here documenting, would be a useful addition uh, to this kind of uh, endeavor. Uh, thank you for your patience and for your accommodation. Thank you very much. Professor Jäger, that was a really well-structured lecture, and I think we begin to see as an audience uh, how you pulled off a very <coughs> difficult struggle. Um, don't get too comfortable, because um, we are running a little bit behind, um, uh, and the powers that be are looking at me to say, why don't you invent another 15 minutes from somewhere? Um, what I suggest is anybody who needs to leave, leave now, um, we will um, spend about seven minutes doing questions and then we'll move upstairs to to a reception and a few of us will then shortly after that have to peel off for uh, for a dinner but let's take a few questions first who'd like to to start us off this is the lady at the back yeah yes, thank you uh, thank you for your very lecture and my question is if let's say we live in ideal world all the will pass through tomorrow we have functioning then, do you hear me or I need to use this? No, please use that. Okay, um, so my question is, because if I'm not mistaken, the President Buhari is in London since January. So even if elections are done properly and your political elites are not sitting in the country, how do you tackle this issue? Thank you. Let's take three questions and then so we'll go to the gentleman to the front. cost of um, uh, this exercise, and I say this because it may set a very high bar, and here I refer to comments by Mr. Kabila when he decided to postpone the elections in DRC because he said, I don't have the money in my budget, and therefore I'm not able to conduct elections. Will this become an excuse for people not to be conducting elections? And our final question number three. Um, yes, the lady just there. Uh, Vivian Ojo, uh, Namibian Nigerian uh, here at the MPP program. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture, Professor. Uh, my question was really around uh, the nature of the elections that you um, oversaw and the idea that it was really serendipitous how there was political will and that matched with um, you know, a courageous individual like yourself as well as the civil society and a, a bunch of different stakeholders coming together to make it happen. I wonder uh, to what extent you think that uh, there are lessons to extrapolate from the um, electoral question to just general corruption in Nigeria. Um, and to what extent that would be then dependent on political will um, or some of the systems and lessons that you have shared with us today. Thank you. So two questions basically about um, wider issues of governance and then one question very focused on how much did this cost? Um, I suggest we actually take the first, that question first. How much did it cost? And then a, a few words about the wider issues of governance. Okay. Um, on the first question, um, I think we, we need to be very, very clear that conducting elections with integrity is necessary, but is not a sufficient condition for good democratic governance. I think it's very, very important because then it helps to clarify that uh, people can come into power uh, having been elected freely and fairly, uh, but still unable to govern uh, uh, effectively. Uh, uh, 
so so uh, I think that's my way of, of answering uh, uh, that uh, question. So there have to be other mechanisms of uh, checking and balancing uh, uh, the uh, use of power once people have been elected and are in government. And uh, that should be independent of the preparation and conduct of elections with integrity. Um, the cost of elections, um, uh, I've always attempted to address this issue in two ways. One is to say uh, you have to balance the cost of election with the cost of not having an elected government or an authoritarian government uh, 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 or the larger benefits of democracy and good governance, which may come uh, from that. So in other words, if the resources are available, uh, as much as is possible should be spent, uh, but of course with the appropriate checks and balances in order to ensure that elections are conducted with integrity. Could you put a dollar figure on the... Yes, I can. Uh, uh, basically, I, I can, there is, there is uh, what do you call it? There is um, expenditure per voter is what is used as a measure of cost of election. And in the Nigerian context, the expenditure per voter is about $11.75 per voter, for, per registered voter, yes, per, per registered voter. You know, and this is actually around the average in the African context. The average in Africa is about $12.5 per voter. So this is a billion dollars cost. Yes, it, it's a huge cost. I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact cost. Yeah, it's, it's exactly. It's a lot of money, even from the, 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 the expenditure on the procurement of equipment was a lot uh, of money, but Nigeria can afford it. I can tell you that the percentage contribution of development partners was less than 1% in the total budget in our elections. You know? And uh, so it's complementary and is good for inclusiveness and participation. You know? But uh, for many other countries, obviously, it becomes a big uh, issue and expensive. But as I said, then they have to measure it with the cost of having to continue to remain uh, in the context. Now, the, the issue Ojo uh, Vivian raised, uh, what extent can correction, uh, corruption be fought in, in a similar manner in which we were able to bring uh, electoral integrity? I, I suppose that's your question. Um, I think uh, basically uh, an election management, I mean, a, 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 an anti-corruption body uh, can use relative autonomy can use integrity, can use resilience, and can use efficient and effective discharge of their responsibilities within the laws uh, to be able to deliver on the fight against corruption. Of course, the fight against corruption in a country like Nigeria it is really perhaps a more Herculean task than conducting elections with integrity. You know, so, but it's possible to deploy some of the measures that we've deployed and to be able to be effective in that fight. And in fact, it's important that that is done because otherwise, once corruption is resilient, it can turn around and also undermine everything that uh, is done. In, in effect, if you, if you have corruption in the, the, the access to power, that's a sort of meta level of corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, everything else is a sort of lower order. Let's take a last couple of questions and uh, yes, the gentleman there and a lady there. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Oli Owen from Oxford Department of International Development. Um, yeah, I think what we can all really admire in this presentation as well is the prevalence of Nigerian solutions to Nigerian challenges here. That this is a story about a fairly unique set of conditions and a fairly unique set of approaches developed. And I just wonder, you talk about the support of development partners and having worked quite a lot with development partners, I know that quite often there is a 
slightly prescriptive approach at times. And I'd just like to know, you talked about the support you got. Were there any examples where you had to push back and say, actually, with respect, we know what we want to do, and thanks for your advice, but we prefer to do it this way? Yeah. And the final question of the lady in the second row. Hi, uh, Bozola. Uh, I'd like to know uh, how you have put in place uh, structures for um, continuity for the changes you've made uh, during your um, during your position, uh, INEC. Well, sneak in a last one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you very much, sir. Um, I'm Ugo Eze. I'm a researcher at the Faculty of Law here in Oxford. Um, so my question really is um, focused more on the judicial process. I'm um, concerned in finding out your thoughts about judicial uh, intervention in the Nigerian uh, electoral system. Is this a good uh, strategy going forward to the long term, or might it prove inimical uh, for consolidating Nigeria's democratic potentials going forward? Okay. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, are there examples of pushback with, in our relationship with development partners? Yes, there are. Uh, as I mentioned, when we decided to embark upon fresh registration, uh, virtually all the development partners said, don't do it, you can't do it, and still do uh, an election. And, uh, and uh, we said, don't tell us that we can't do it. Tell us how best uh, we can do it. Uh, and uh, obviously, um, they brought, when we came in, in 2010, we discovered that uh, some of the development partners had brought experts to advise the commission on how to clean up the register, this register that I described, you know, and I think a mindset had developed that the register should be cleaned and that there should be no attempt to do a fresh register. So, so really we had to push back and say, look, if the government can fund it, we would rather do a new register because that's the only way to ensure that we have uh, uh, elections with integrity. You know, and, uh, and obviously then we said, okay, how can you help us? And we found ways where having pushed on what we needed, they could still help us to actualize that. We had to do a massive procurement of equipment uh, there was nowhere where we could get the equipment we wanted to our design and specification within the time we needed it, other than, guess, China. <laughs> so we had to go to China, uh, and we now got the Joint Donor Basket Fund managed by the UNDP to fund quality assurance so that the equipment that were produced could not be shipped until they could certify the quality uh, of the materials, and so they also added value uh, in the process and participated uh, uh, in that. But otherwise, in general, we, we really had a mutually beneficial relationship, and uh, it also, th that kind of relationship helped a lot. Some donors would rather act bilaterally, and we tried to discourage that, and that was one area of pushback, and encourage as many of them as possible to pool resources in the Joint Donor Basket Fund because it helped to ease transactions and to minimize uh, 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 not only the transaction costs, but to also help have a more coordinated approach and definition of responsibilities. And it worked a lot in the Nigerian context. Uh, of course, there were still countries that uh, only act bilaterally and couldn't go into the Joint Donor Basket Fund. The US has to act through USAID uh, and the other international organizations uh, in the US, N NDI, IRI, <coughs> IFES, we had to deal with them separately. But in all cases, the relationship was mutually beneficial and very, very supportive. Yes, and um, now, structures of continuity, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to say that when we designed uh, the processes of restructuring and reorganization, it was with a view uh, to have an effective and efficient and strong institution that in future we don't have to rely on the idiosyncrasies of the person at the head. 
you know. So we try to build a lot of capacity, you know, and uh, 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 also with the support of development partners do some change management uh, training uh, for the staff, even though it's one area that I think a lot more needs to be done uh, in, in the future. You know, but I think two clear examples of continuity uh, is that the person who served for five years as my chief technical advisor, a professor uh, of political science, uh, is now made a national commissioner in the commission. And the person who served as my special uh, uh, advisor uh, uh, is also now retained by the chairman of the electoral commission as his special uh, advisor. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, one of the key commissioners that I worked with uh, has also been retained as a member of the commission. So I think uh, I, 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 we've done our bit. And we also developed a strategic plan that was meant not to only help us deliver the 2015 general elections, but to also help develop the capacity of INEC uh, with a vision of making it the best election management body in Africa. And a lot of the things there are about institution building and strengthening, you know, and ensuring that there is a sustainable basis uh, for continuous work with integrity in the commission. So I feel, I feel that we've, we've done a bit, and there is need, uh, of course, uh, for the new commission to sustain that. Uh, ju the judicial process, I must say that initially the, the judicial process was obstructive. Uh, uh, we have had situations where courts at different levels, uh, and even courts with concurrent jurisdiction, were issuing orders that conflicted with each other with regards to preparations and conduct of election. You know, and that was very disruptive of the electoral process. Uh, we tried to engage the judiciary, but you know, given the perception of independence of the judiciary and their adjudicatory role, it's difficult also to have uh, closer interactions with them. Uh, but I think changes in the leadership of the judiciary also bring a good quality that impacts on the work of the judiciary. Before the 2015 general election, the new Chief Justice was very, very proactive and was able to stop all the courts from these conflicting orders uh, and also uh, tried to use the National Judicial Council to sanitize the judiciary itself because there are a lot of uh, uh, corrupt practices related to election uh, uh, funding. You know, so really, the judiciary is required uh, to strengthen the work of an election management body. In fact, one good example is India, you know, where virtually a tradition has developed that the Indian uh, uh, courts you know, virtually endorse the de decisions of the Electoral Commission to the extent that now politicians really don't contest you know, uh, the decisions uh, of the Electoral Commission because they know that uh, it brings respectability. Uh, in the Nigerian context, the fear that it can be, the power can be abused uh, was one thing, but, but I think Nigerians are also more litigious. Is it litigious? Is that the legal word? <laughs> Everything has to end in court. And, uh, well, everything has to end, <laughs> including this. Um, where, uh, Britain can devalue the pound and has done, Nigeria has devalued the naira. I unfortunately can't devalue the minute. Um, and that means because we're half an hour over, I've actually substituted what you've offered, which is food for thought. We'd initially planned to offer you a little food at a reception, but I'm afraid you've had food for thought instead. I hope you agree that that was better. Um, uh, those of us privileged to, um, to, to, to accompany you and join you for dinner, we're to head upstairs to the top floor. Um, uh, otherwise, let us all join in thanking Professor Yeager very much. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Really good. All right, thank you.